Well, two weeks ago, we looked at Ephesians 4, 7. We saw that even though we don't deserve it, God uses us to do ministry to other people. We said, that's God's grace. We saw that the word for spiritual gifts, charisma, or charismata, comes from the word charis, which means grace. So when Paul says to each one of us, grace was given, in Ephesians 4, 7, he means that each believer receives a charisma, a gift which is grace. It's grace to have it, and it gives grace to others. So we are grace givers. Last week, we saw that God gave us the apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We said that the word apostle can mean either any missionary or especially it can mean the 12 apostles appointed by Jesus Christ, including the Apostle Paul. So now, the 12 apostles are different from the missionary apostles because the 12 apostles wrote God's living word. We saw that the word prophet can mean people in the church who speak messages to us today, but they don't write scripture, or those people who God gave to the church to write scripture. So we also said that these days we still have missionary apostles. If you're a missionary, you're an apostle of a sort. And we probably have message-giving prophets too. But we no longer have people who can speak or write God's words. That's over. So when Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.11, he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. The apostles and prophets there are talking about scripture writing apostles and scripture writing prophets so god gave us those scripture writing apostles and scripture writing prophets to create the word of god for us the new testament and god also gave us evangelists pastors and teachers to teach that word of god and the question is why well paul says that god gave these people to prepare all God's people for the work of service, to build up the body of Christ. Two, prepare all God's people for the work of service, to build up the body of Christ. So when God's people do the work of service and building up of Christ's body, all believers come to oneness in their faith, in Jesus Christ, that's the only way. Believers also come to know jesus christ very deeply because remember it said unto the oneness of the faith um to the knowledge of the son of god believers also become mature and grow up to the measurement of the fullness of jesus christ and we talked about what this fullness of jesus christ is it's jesus christ working in every part of a believer's life okay this week and next week, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 19. But I needed this long introduction to remind you of what this is all about. How do we become grace givers? And what is the goal of building up Christ's body? So now we have a problem. Last week, I did not explain what Paul meant by we shall all become mature people. I said we would look at that when we looked at verse 14. This is what it says there. We shall no longer be children carried about by waves and blown about by every shifting wind of teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. So when the apostles and prophets produce scripture, when evangelists, pastors, and teachers prepare believers for doing the work of service, the building up of Christ's body, the believers will not be children. The word children um, here really is babies. So they won't be babies. I mean, babies are great, right? For a while, they're great. And they're cute and sweet and everything, but it isn't good to stay babies. Why? Because babies are always needy and um, they need someone else to bathe them they need someone else to feed them to clothe them to protect them 
They're too little to understand about what is safe, what's not safe. They don't know what is good food and what is poison. They don't know whom they can trust and who they should run away from. I mean, they're just babies. And Paul says, we're no longer supposed to be babies. We're not supposed to be children. And so we're wondering, why would people try to deceive babies? Because look what it says. We shall no longer be children, and this word is babies, carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. When I was working on this message, I kept looking at this verse and asking myself, who are these deceitful people? Why, why are these people trying to harm the Christian babies? I'm talking about immature Christians who are easily carried by the wind and tossed about by the waves. Um, why are people harming these Christian babies? Uh, these people are deceitful, Paul says. He says that they lead people into error. They invent tricks to fool people. So who are these people? Well, verses 17, 18, and 19 tell us they're unbelievers. We're not talking about Christians who just teach bad teachings. We're talking about unbelievers, people who worship idols. And these unbelievers, these people who worship idols, are misleading Christians. They're trying to deceive these baby Christians, and they're trying to lead them away from Jesus. And we want to help baby Christians become mature because idol worshipers and non-Christians are out to deceive them. So then we have to ask the question, why are they doing this? And for that, we need to move to verse 17 of Ephesians. So let's read it. In the Lord's name, then I warn you, do not continue to live like the heathen whose thoughts are worthless and whose minds are in the dark. They have no part in the life that God gives, for they are completely ignorant and stubborn. They have lost all feeling of shame. They give themselves over to vice and do all sorts of indecent things without restraint. Now, it's pretty easy to understand what this is saying, but there's something really weird about it. Why do unbelievers live this way? And if we can understand this, we can understand these three verses, and then next week we can go back and look at verses 14 through 16, which will really make sense then, okay? So what we're going to do is try to explain this. And the way we're going to do that is by going to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Do not love the world or anything that belongs to the world. If you love the world, you do not love the Father. Everything that belongs to the world, what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of, none of this comes from the Father. It all comes from the world. So now we have the strangest thing here because we have to deal with this idea of the world. Because that's really what we're talking about in Ephesians chapter 4. It's the world that's the problem. The world is trying to lead baby Christians away from Christ, or any Christians away from Christ. So we have to say, what is the world? Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So this is an interesting statement in verse 16. Everything that belongs to the world, what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of, None of this comes from the Father. Now, what I want to start with is say, wait a minute. Everything that belongs to the world, literally everything that's in the world, what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of, that's what's in the world. I, I, I need. I want. I'm better. <laughs> I know that there are buildings, and I know that there are ships, and I know that there are countries, and I know that there are people, but what's really in the world I want, or what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of, that's what's really in the world. All the other stuff we have in the world that we see, that we live in, 
Those are just sort of like props in a play on a stage. The heart of everything is what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of. That's what the world is. What does that mean? Let's look at it. Well, we've just seen these guys, but it wasn't in an apple. Because this isn't really an apple. It's the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I, I, I need. I want. I'm better. And these three guys are in that fruit. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they thought they were getting knowledge. But what they were really getting is what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of. That's what they swallowed. Meet Sam. Hi. What's wrong, Sam? Dr. Bob, I have such a problem. Well, I try to be a godly Christian, but I'm always sinning, and I don't understand why. Why is it so hard for me? Sam's problem is the world. What people naturally desire, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of. The world in Sam is driving him to make decisions which are not for God, but are for the world. I, I, I need... I need food. I, I, I need... I need clothing. I, I, I need... I need safety. I, I, I need... I need friends. I, I, I need... I need help. When Adam and Eve ate that fruit, they were changed, permanently changed, and all of those who come from them have been changed. Now, whenever they look at anything, whenever they want anything, they're driven by desire and pride instead of what God intended, which was to be driven by love. So now we have a situation where poor Sam constantly is struggling and he doesn't even realize the source of his struggles are his desires and his pride. Look at Sam's eyes. You can see desire there. It's what people see and want, and it's driving how he looks at everything. I want. I'm tired of only having biryani. I'd like to have some really classy food. I want. I sure wish I had nice clothing like Yakub. I want. I wish I had a nice car to drive instead of this stupid motorbike. I want. Why is Yakub so much more popular than I am? I wish that people liked me the way they like him. I want. How come the professor always helps Yakub instead of helping me? What's that all about? Now these desires look demonic, but they're not. They're natural human desires. Now Eve had desires before she ate the fruit. Adam had desires before he ate the fruit. However, once they ate the fruit, they were driven by desires. They were so driven by desires, they could not really say no to them. And that's what the world is all about. It's about these desires which drive us. It's also about pride. Okay, so I'm not rich, but at least I have a good beginning. I'm better. It's not like I'm a common laborer, like some of the other guys I went to school with. I'm better. And I'm starting to watch these amazing YouTube videos and I understand them. They're improving my mind. I'm better. I used to just be a Punjabi village boy, but I'm making something of myself. I'm better. I kind of feel bad about the fact that I've been missing church, but my job takes a lot of my time and I'm so tired on Sundays. I just need to recuperate. I'm better. It's really exciting how I am growing up. I'm so much better. You can see as you're watching this how these things, desire and pride, drive the way we live. And the sins that we commit, they come from this. James says, what is the source of quarrels among you? Isn't it your pleasures which wage war in your members? And James says, do not say if you're being tempted, I am being tempted by God, because God isn't tempted by anybody, and he, is not temp he doesn't tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is dragged away and enticed by his desires. See, that's the thing. Not even sinful desires, just any desires. But what happens is when we have those desires, those desires drive us to do sin. And that's where it comes from. So let's look at this and how this plays itself out 
in Sam's life here. I, I understand that we need to trust in the Lord and all of that. I want to be better. But we have to be realistic. I mean, this is Pakistan, right? I want to be better. If the only way to get that job is to bribe the office manager, then I, I, I want to be better. That's what I'm going to do. I need food in my table. I, I need clothes and I need better transportation. I, I, I want to be better. It's the practical people who get the good jobs. I, I, I want to be better. The spiritual people, they end up with the low paying jobs. I don't want that. So now listen to what Paul says about these people. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. In the Lord's name, then, I warn you, do not continue to live like the heathen whose thoughts are worthless and whose minds are in the dark. They have no part in the life that God gives, for they are completely ignorant and stubborn. They have lost all feeling of shame. They give themselves over to vice and do all sorts of indecent things without restraint. In a lot of ways, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time in this because it's pretty obvious. But I'm going to go through these quickly, give you an idea of what we have to watch out for. Remember, these three guys are not demons. These three guys are desires and pride. They're not demons. They're just natural human desires and pride. But they lead people, they drive people, they drag people to be like this so that their thoughts are worthless. And why are their thoughts worthless? Well, they say there is no God. Well, of course there's a God. It's obvious there's a God. They say that the baby in the mother's womb is not a baby. Of course it's a baby. How could you believe that? How could you believe there is no God? How could you believe that that baby is not a real baby? Well, because desires and pride drive us to think worthless and stupid things. We just do. Because we're not using our intellect. We're being driven by our desires and pride. Secondly, their minds are in the dark. They don't have the opportunity to hear light, to hear truth, to hear the word of God. And they can't hear it because they're living in the dark. I know what that's like. You know what that's like. When the Bintley goes out, you know what it's like to be in the dark. They live that way every day because their desires and their pride drive them away from the light. Third, they have no light, no part in the life that God gives. Fourth, they are completely ignorant. They, there's so many things they don't know. They should know. They should know so many wonderful things about this creation, about life, about what's good and bad. But they purposely teach themselves not to see. It says they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Fifth, they're stubborn. They're stubborn, hard-hearted, unwilling to listen, unwilling to change. They believe idiotic things. They're ignorant. And yet, at the same time, they won't listen to reason, to common sense. Next, they've lost all feeling of shame. Boy, I'll tell you, we've seen this in America. I mean, it's unbelievable what we've seen in America. People are doing things which you would never have imagined 50 years ago when I was a, when I was a teenager. They never would have done these things. And now, if you don't endorse what they're doing, you're a bad person. And they give themselves over to vice. So when it says vice here, it's talking about sexual immorality, but not a normal kind of sexual immorality. It's sexual immorality without any boundaries, without any walls of what's right and wrong. It's sexual immorality that is so out of control that it, anybody on the outside is going to think that they're crazy. And finally, they do all sorts of indecent things without any restraint. There's nothing to hold them back. This has gone crazy in this world. Why? Well, because people are not being driven by love. They're not being driven by God's truth. They're not being driven by God's word. What are they being driven by? Their desires and their pride. Their desires, first of all, their natural, natural desires and what they see and want, covetousness, envy, and then everything in this world that people are so proud of. Desire, 
and envy or covetousness and pride. That's the world we're living in. And this world seeks to destroy God's people. When it says that the world hates God's people, the reason it says that the world hates us is because the world is being driven by desire. And we are coming and saying, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. They're like, no, wait a minute. Don't tell us that we have to deny ourselves. We want our desire. We want our pleasures. We want our success. We want our pride. Don't you be telling us how we're supposed to live. I've heard scientists say that they don't believe in God, even though there's so much seeming evidence that there is a God, because if they believed in God, then they'd have to follow God's rules, and they don't want to follow God's rules. So they become ignorant, stubborn, no feeling of shame, giving themselves over to vice, doing all sorts of indecent things without restraint. Why? Because the alternative is not acceptable. And if a Christian is living, walking, ex exhibiting the Christian life with self-control, with love, with mercy, with humility, a person who doesn't do those things is going to be threatened by them. I mean, that's why they killed Jesus.